it allows us to continue to do programs like this with such incredible panelists like we have. So thank you and welcome. And there are a number of upcoming programs as well that um, also connect to our current exhibition, The Frick Reflects. And um, I encourage you to check them out, go online and see what's available. Um, quickly, I'm just gonna remind everyone we are in a webinar. So our attendees do not have audio or visual um, capabilities, but you can communicate with us. I'm gonna ask that you, if you're making a, to, uh, asking a question or making a comment about the content, about what we're talking about, please use the Q&A function. It's at the bottom of your screen. You simply click it and you can ask a question and it comes to all of us. Um, and if you have any other sort of side questions, you can also use the chat. We're monitoring both. And I, we will have a Q&A at the end, but we are interested in having this be a discussion. Uh, conversation. So please ask your questions when you think of them or as we're going. We will try to get as uh, to as many as we can um, in the moment, but we if we don't get to them, we will do our best to get them at the end. So please, um, we want this to be open, uh, an open conversation. So I want to say a few things about the faces that I'm looking at right now and the faces that you're looking at right now. Um, I'm really excited to welcome Joel Tarr, he is the Richard Calagiri Prof uh, University Professor of History at Carnegie Mellon University. He studies the environmental history of cities and the history and impact of their technological systems. He is all, uh, particularly interested in using history to understand contemporary problems, which is why we're excited about him being here tonight. Um, he has served as president of the Public Works Historical Society and the president of the Ur uh, Urban History Association, and also served on the National Research Council, um, which dealt with issues of urban infrastructure, public transit, water pollution, et cetera. Um, I'm also happy to welcome my colleague, uh, from other projects, Marika Hecht. Um, she's the, an assistant professor of recreation, park, and tourism management at Penn State Greater Allegheny. Um, she brings an interdisciplinary approach to her teaching and research, weaving together environmental education, community-based ecological design, learning sciences, and naturalist practices. Previously, Marika worked in Pittsburgh Parks for 14 years, where she spearheaded two major projects that you may have heard of. Um, the Nine Mile Run Aquatic Ecosystem Restoration and the Design and Construction of the Frick Environmental Center. So we're going to touch on both Joel and Marika's uh, knowledge of, of history and uh, Marika's knowledge of these new projects in the city as well. And, and finally, the punctuation is Kim Cady. Um, she's the Assistant Curator of the Car and Carriage Museum at the Frick Pittsburgh. Um, she's been in this role for four years and she cares for and develops exhibitions related to the organization's historic transportation collection. Um, Kim has a BA from Mansfield University and MA in Museum Studies from University of Oklahoma. So welcome. Welcome everyone. Um, I just, I, I have gone back and forth about how to do bios for people. Um, sometimes I just want to praise them and read all the things they've accomplished, but it gets very long. And sometimes I want them to tell the, about themselves as well. So if there's anything about your work or past or interest that you want to share, that's why we're here too, to, to interweave that into the conversation. Um, so I'm gonna just say a few words before we begin, and then we're gonna uh, tackle a, a number of core questions about the legacy of industry in Pittsburgh and the impact of men like Henry Clay Frick on our city, um, our natural surroundings and our shared spaces. So, um, so when we thought about doing this program um, at, and thought about the inspiration, what the inspiration was for this program and the current exhibition at the Frick, which is Frick Reflects Looking Back, Moving Forward. Um, the Frick Pittsburgh is a result of one person's vision, Helen Clay Frick. And much of that was in service and to honor her father, the legacy of her father, Henry Clay Frick. Um, the exhibition and our conversation tonight and the slate of programs that we develop at the Frick uh, around this exhibition really examines the circumstances in which our institution came to hold certain values um, and the stories that are told and untold that our collection reveals. The exhibition also desi is designed by our incredible curatorial staff. Kim is a, a part of that. Um, 
And it was a personal and professional journey for them and for all of the staff at the Frick to really delve into um, asking a number of large core questions about um, what we do and why we do it and who gets to say what it is that we present. Um, we're addressing institutional issues that we maybe haven't in the past and we know that and we are striving to do that more with a, a conversation like we're having here tonight and many other nights this month. Um, and we know we don't have all the answers, but through ex exhibitions like this and conversations like this we're about to, that we're about to have, we can more openly and honestly tackle um, the reality of the past and step into our new beginnings. So um, I just wanted to share a little bit about why we're doing this. And Kim is gonna give you an even more in-depth um, discussion of the exhibition and some history on the Fricks. So go ahead, Kim, thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna first share my screen here, hopefully. I need to be able to do that, please. Yes, you should be able to do that. Oh, I'm so sorry. Hold, please. Go on. <laughs> so, yes. So as Lisa was saying, um, 2020 for us was quite uh, an adventure as it was probably for most of you. Um, for the Frick particularly, 2020 marked our anniversaries of both the um, public opening of Clayton, the Frick family's historic home, and it was the 30th anniversary, it opened in 1990, and then the 50th anniversary of the opening of the Frick Art Museum. So when we originally started planning for exhibitions last year to, to recognize these events, um, we had thought of different approaches. And then with the pandemic and other unprecedented events of 2020, we really wanted to take the time and do kind of a more um, introspective look at our collection uh, with a more critical eye examining our institutional origin story. So with that, we developed the Frick Reflects, looking back, moving forward. And we're really looking at, um, as, as Lisa kind of indicated, an institution that was built on privilege, um, unbelievable privilege, unbelievable wealth, but also looking at a time period of gender roles um, power, race, philanthropy, and legacy. So we, we went through our, um, our permanent collection, we pulled out pieces, and we kind of put that all together. And for the most part, the exhibition focuses on Helen Clay Frick, our benefactress who created these institutions. But we really couldn't tell this story without first examining kind of the role Henry Clay, Henry Clay Frick played in our institutional founding. So Henry Clay Frick, for those of you who are unaware, um, was an industrialist in the late 19th century, early 20th century, who garnered his wealth through the production of coke. So coke is the fuel used to kind of do, um, to create iron, core, iron ore smelting and used in the steel industry. It is uh, achieved by burning coal at high temperatures to then create this fuel product that is used in the industry. Henry Clay Frick, by the time he was 33 years old, owned one third of the largest coal seam in Western Pennsylvania, um, more than any of his nearest competitors. By 1905, he had roughly 31,000 Coke ovens producing about 8 million um, tons of coal, uh, tons of Coke. And this of course garnered him the title of Coke King and as well as made him a millionaire by the time he was 30. So for us here in Pittsburgh, Frick's notoriety doesn't, isn't based solely on his art collecting, which is probably what he's most known for outside of this area in New York. He has a, a beautiful collection of world famous art. But here in Pittsburgh, he's probably best known as being the strong arm of Andrew Carnegie and the leader of the Homestead Steel Strike in 1892. So even at a time where anti-union sentiments were very high, Frick was a particularly ruthless opponent of labor in, in his industry to the extent that in 1892, during a steel strike, he brought in the Pinkerton guards to quell the strike, resulting in deaths on both sides. These efforts in 1892 led to um, a weakening of the labor unions, not only in Pittsburgh, but nationally, um, resulting in um, limiting negotiations for workers and workers' rights up to the 1930s. 
So Frick amounts all this wealth through, through the industry, through steel, through coke. And he, along with other industrialists of the area, really are able to then use that money toward public policy, toward political power, wielding a great deal of political power, very similar to kind of what we see today with um, Citizens United and money in politics. So a lot of these favors, political favors were granted over card games of cards and, and drinks in back rooms, um, often beyond the eyes of public scrutiny. So in our collection, we did pair some of these items you can see in the right hand corner. Um, Frick did have a very lovely poker set and over Holt whiskey as part of the Frick family legacy. And so we really wanted to kind of put that picture into perspective for people to understand that this kind of capital cronyism was going on in these backroom deals. And it was because these, these handful of men, predominantly white males, um, not even predominantly, entirely white males, really ran the country in the late 19th and early 20th century. So labor policies, tariffs, safety standards, and environmental regulations were all determined by these men who profited the most. So in thinking, when thinking about Frick's legacy um, here in Pittsburgh and afar, uh, we decided to pair these two pieces from our collection to really kind of put this, this whole thing in perspective. So on the left, we have what is what we determined to be Frick's first known art purchase in 1881, paired with a more recent 2006 um, image of the Edgar Thompson Steelworks. Ironically, in 1890, Henry Clay Frick's oldest daughter, Martha, was actually responsible for lighting one of the furnaces here at the Edward Thompson Works. So there is a nice connection between, between the two pieces. So on the left, we have George Hetzel's um, Landscape with River, a river with landscape, rather, painted in 1880. Frick purchased this in 1881. You can see it's a beautiful bucolic landscape, blue skies, green trees, rolling rivers. Compared to the image on the right, which is a mezzotint print, by Craig McPherson, another local artist that depicts the Edgar Thompson works in 2006. And looking at that image, the thing that stands out the most is the billowing plumes of black smoke emanating from these buildings. So while Henry Clay Frick is purchasing this um, painting in 1881, preserving and collecting this beautiful landscape, he and others are already decimating the landscapes around them. By 1881, steel, iron, coal, railroads, and coke dominate the industry, dominate the landscape here in Pittsburgh with mills, plants, forges, and foundries very similar to the Edgar Thompson works dotting along the riversides and hillsides all around Pittsburgh. So in, by 1910, Pittsburgh produced more than 25 million tons of steel, more than 60% of the national um, total, the total of the national average. Smog, once seen as a sign of prosperity in the 1890s, by the 1930s is being realized to be a health hazard. So all of this is going on due to kind of this progress of industry. And although we're moving forward and creating these jobs and, and, and plants and opportunities, we're also taking away from people's lives and, and their ability to have a quality of life. So amongst the many questions that we asked during this ex exhibition, one of them that we thought we might be able to address this evening is what is industry's um, continued impact on our quality of life here in Pittsburgh and nationally. So with that, I will pass it on to my colleagues to kind of take it from there and tell us more about what we have to look forward to. Well, can I ask um, quickly before we, uh, that is our sort of our central question or one of the central questions. Marika and Joel, what are you, what are your initial thoughts when you see those two images juxtaposed? Um, it's not a deeper question than that. What, are your, what do you think of? Um, I was really struck by how um, illustrative they were of not just a historical framing of what is nature, but a framing of what is nature that still persists. And I think that really undermines our ability to live in a healthy, equitable, and just world. And that is of a nature that is bucolic, that is absent of humans, that needs to be preserved and separated from us. Um, and as you know, we continue to talk here today about past as prologue, which I think is a very provocative um, framing for our discussion. You know, prologue is the beginning of something, which then makes me ask the beginning of what? What do we want the past to be the beginning of for the future? And how might we, um, 
really reorient the ways that humans interact with the more than human aspects of the natural world. And so if I were to do my own bio, you know, that is the main thrust of everything that I've done professionally as a student, now as a professor is really thinking about how to, how to knit together nature and culture. Um, and you could just see this very sharp divide in those two pieces um, next to each other. Well, um, is it my turn, Lisa? Should I? <laughs> it's your turn, Joel. No, Joel, I, I, it's always your turn. No, it's not. <laughs> but, um, I mean, those certainly those two images juxtaposition um, there um, are very striking, um, and um, the but the extent to which even those places that seemed like they were not to be touched as reflected in um, the further 1881 painting was scarred in so many ways over the decades. So it's really kind of ironic that for Frick who was a master art collector, of course, just like Carnegie was too, um, so many of his activities and the activities of his um, firms and the workers um, desecrated the environment. And I think at least this might be the time to throw that first that slide of the Coke ovens. Yes. Um, on the. Um... Um, just give me one quick second. Oops. All right. So here we have your first slide, Joel. Yeah, I think Kim already told us about um, the, the the extent to which Frick had been able to dominate the Coke, the, the areas around Connorsville, the, the center of the Coke um, region, um, and to create and to erect and to own thousands of beehive Coke ovens. And um, I, I've actually studied um, the impact of these beehive coke ovens on the atmosphere and the land um, in that part of Western Pennsylvania. And it was incredibly severe. Um, and there are comments made by visitors coming through and by people from the USGS, for instance, also coming through about how incredibly defaced the environment, the air and the land was by the presence of these coke ovens where they were basically burning bituminous coal, driving off the impurities in order to produce a piece of almost pure carbon to use, to, to use in the um, steel making process. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so and, and this, the other part of it, of course, is that the uh, kind of labor and the work and the work under the very if difficult incredibly hot conditions that existed for the thousands of workers that worked um, um, in Frick's um, Coke, um, beehive Coke oven um, areas. Now, one thing that should be pointed out is that Frick did create many um, towns, um, patch towns, and the conditions in the company towns created by Frick actually were better than the conditions in many other company towns created by the coal industry, better sanitary conditions, um, better structures, and so on. But Frick ruled them with an eye and hand. And there were very strict rules that applied to people that lived in these towns. And if they broke the rules, they were going to be evicted um, from their homes. So the company towns and the company store all are part of a method of control used by magnates like Frick um, to control their workforce um, and to make sure that they were continually um, producing. Now, um, I don't know, I could talk just a bit more about um, the changes in the coke industry and I think this is important. Um, this is a picture, but what happens is that the beehive coke oven basically begins to be outmoded by 1900 and the byproduct coke oven begins to take its place. And the largest byproduct coke oven 
in the world at the time it is built, and today probably still the largest one, is the Clarendon Coke Works. So what you have is you shift the Coke making process from the beehive Coke ovens around the Connorsville area, and you shift that Coke making process much closer to the iron and steel mills in the Monongahela Valley, for instance. Um, and so what you're doing is really shifting much of the pollution load that been, was created by this process of coke making from that part of rural southwestern Pennsylvania um, to the area, the much more urbanized area um, around Pittsburgh and in the Monongahela Valley. So there you have the way in which an industry that makes brick incredibly wealthy um, um, and powerful, of course, he became a partner with Andrew Carnegie because Carnegie needed the coke in order to make his steel, um, how it shifted that burden to a different part of the state um, and exposed more and more people as we find out every day when you look at the reports of the air quality conditions um, uh, around the Clarendon Coke Works, um, shifted that burden to the uh, to urbanites, um, whereas before that it had been focused mostly on um, in, in areas that were more rural areas. Um, I can talk about this slide also. I, I only put a few slides, but when I came to Pittsburgh in 1967 and I drove up the, the what was called the Penn Lincoln Highway, but it's I-376 obviously. And we drove by the Eliza blast furnaces. And here they are pictured, you can see what immensely important and, and huge structures they are for the steel making of these blast furnaces for the steel making process. And Coke was an essential ingredient though um, for, this, for this process. Um, these, as, uh, we get, I can show you later on, we can talk a bit about it. These are now gone, of course, but there was an aesthetic quality actually to, to this kind of industrial development. And many people that saw it and passed by um, through the region, drove, came by train particularly, would comment on the aesthetics of industry. So I think that's important to see it not only as something that defames the environment, it's critical to the steel making process, but also has a kind of aesthetic quality to it um, that can be very powerful for many people. <laughs> Joel, can I um, just interject quickly? Um, we have a comment and I, it makes me think of something that Marika, you said when we had our a previous conversation. Um, I'm just gonna read this quickly for us to reflect on. It's a, a, of course the scenic picture is beautiful, meaning the one that Kim showed us. And all of us want to be able to experience nature like that in all its glory. However, the picture on the right, um, which was the, Craig, the McPherson, allowed us to provide the massive quantities of steel necessary to help us win World War II and World War I and World War II. Without that industry, where would we be now? And of course, we can clean up all those fumes, um, but we just need to provide the technology. What is your response to that comment? Um, can I ask Marika if you wanna, it makes me think of the comment when you talked about the ne necessity um, or the, maybe the, that industry can be part of nature um, or human nature. <laughs> yeah, um, and it is obviously very much a part of human nature. And I love where Joel was going with this idea of a kind yeah. of industrial aesthetic. Um, and I think we can yeah. see now in the renovations at the Cary Blast Furnace, kind of how that aesthetic is being reinterpreted for people who have been down there. Um, this is a really interesting um, and an important point about kind of how we think about our history of extraction in this region as a country, as a, as a world that sees progress as dependent on extraction. And I guess what I wonder is a couple of things. I wonder about um, whether the scenic beauty of that, of the painting on the left is really what we, what we ought to hope for. Um, is there a reframing? Is there a placing of people in that scenic beauty? Um, is there a way to see urban spaces as aesthetically beautiful um, because humans are part of them? I think that's an important piece here 
um, for us to change the way we use extraction. Um, I mean, I'm sitting in a house that has steel and wood and electricity and all of these wonderful things. Um, and we, we certainly benefit and appreciate from them, appreciate them. But what, how do we think about consumption in a more sustainable way? Um, and I think what we learned from history is that we did it very unsustainably. Um, even in the way that we approach it economically, it's unsustainable because look, the industry is not here. It was not sustained in our region. Right. So how might we think about um, providing the, I even hesitate to use natural resources. I, I'm frustrated with that framing of, of things that we engage with in the natural world, but let's just say natural resources because everyone understands what that is. How do we, um, benefit from natural resources at the same time that we give back to natural resources in a more reciprocal way. Mm -hmm. And I think part of that is by stopping, imagining the natural resources and nature is something outside of us and recognizing that we are part of this natural system and that when we don't give back to the natural system, it is us that will suffer in the end. Joel? I was gonna join in if I may. Please. Um, I, I think that as I, person who teaches about industrial America and teaches about the history of technology um, in, this, in this country particularly, um, I certainly do not understate the power and the energy that went into creating uh, many of these industries that were critical um, in the war effort, for instance, as was mentioned, um, as much supposedly as much steel was produced in the Carnegie and steel plants, uh, Jones at Steel U.S. Steel during the Second World War was produced in all of Germany. Um, so there's no doubt there is a huge balancing thing that goes on um, in terms of production, industrial production, the furnishing of jobs um, um, for people who came to this country to find jobs um, and to improve the quality of their lives. But there is always this tension. And I think that we have, we make a, a, a bad mistake if we overlook the fact that there's a cost that's paid um, for much of this um, incredible productivity um, that's produced. And, um, and that cost in many cases is still, parts of it is still with us um, as we were talking about before in terms of various aspects of environmental um, pollution. And I've mentioned a couple of times the, the problem that we have in this region, which is not talked about very widely, but certainly exists, of the quality of the soil and the extent to which heavy metal metals were deposited over many, many years into the soils um, of the Pittsburgh region, as many people who try to start home gardens are discovering. Mm -hmm. um, just as um, this is a slide on the um, screen right now, this is for me such a poignant picture I took this picture um, it probably in about 1980, um, approximately. It is the mill that was known as Dorothy Six in the US Steelworks in Duquesne. And Dorothy Six is particularly interesting because um, when US Steel decided to close down, it already closed down the, um, the works at Homestead, decided to close down the Duquesne works also, which they were all Carnegie works at one time or another. Um, the, the workers in the factory claimed that they had, they had the ability um, to basically to get that steel blast furnaces working again and making them profitable. And the um, U.S. Steel said, all right, well, if you think you can do it, we're going to bring in an outside consultant <coughs> um, uh, to examine your, what, what you say you can do and the figures and let's see if it can be done, we can do it. Well, what happened was that the consulting report that came in said, no, it is not possible. And so here we have them taking down Dorothy Six. And as they said, it's, it's a poignant picture. Um, we've, there's so many other images that we could have um, shown of, that done by painters of the power of the mills mm -hmm. and the quality of the light around them, you know. But then you have to juxtaposition it also with pictures like this. So there's always a kind of a tension there. Um, it's not a matter of, of 
of overlooking one side of it. It's a matter of balancing the way we look at and understand um, the impacts upon the environment and our health, of course. Mm -hmm. Um, Joel, I'm, uh, I'm going to make an assumption. <laughs> this is sort of a progression here of different sites over time. Um, and so the beginning here where there was that aesthetic that people were drawn to, and then sort of the, the falling of a site. Um, can you tell us about this here on Hazelwood Avenue or near Hazelwood Avenue? <laughs> this is again, um, and I'm, this is a uh, I have a couple of, just a couple of slides here before and after. This is the Jones and Lachlan Beehive, um, uh, not Beehive, but Jones and Lachlan Byproduct Coke plant um, that was located in um, Hazelwood right up to 18, uh, I'm sorry, right up to 1995, as a matter of fact. And you used to be able to stand on Flagstaff Hill right outside of Carnegie Mellon University and watch that plume of white smoke, which came about because of the quenching of red hot coke with, um, with, um, with water um, and the quenching of that and creating that plume, of course. And, um, and what happened was that uh, that became the, 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 that particular location um, became one of the last steel making operations, certainly the last that Jones and Lachlan Steel had um, to be um, to continue working, although the Edgar Thompson works, of course, are still working. Um, but it uh, existed there um, until um, eight, uh, 1995. And you could smell on the Carnegie Mellon campus on some days, the sofa smell from the, um, from the mm. quenching of the, of, the, of the Coke. Now, of course, and I talked about before and after. So I don't know whether you want to throw the other slide up now, Lisa, or not. OK. I think the, 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 the Jones and Lachlan byproduct coke plant location, which is right next to where the Eliza furnaces were when the Jones and Lachlan um, blast furnaces were, um, is, is particularly interesting because it is the last major brownfield within the city of Pittsburgh that is undergoing renovation in a process called the, the um, Hazelwood Green um, where, where the, both the University of Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon University have, um, have developed projects on the, on, the, on the site. The site has been cleared, but some of the buildings, particularly the roundhouse, for instance, um, that have been utilized by Jones and Lachlan Steel and by the railroads um, are being renovated. So it's, it, this is, just, again, the question of, and Marika will certainly be talking about this more than I can, but about the way in which we can renovate and revitalize sites that at one time or another um, were completely um, basically turned over to industry. Um, and of course, this is a picture of the Pittsburgh Technology Center along the Monongahela River. If you go back to that first picture I showed you of the Eliza furnaces, and that of course was cleared out that site. And eventually up, this is what has taken its place primarily an R&D center um, uh, oriented towards production, uh, for, uh, oriented towards industry. And Excuse me. Production. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's, that's. That was, I had trigger finger, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, I wanted to, Marika, I wanna ask you um, to speak on the question of, can nature survive the progress of industry and how? <laughs> um, but before we, answer that, I do want to mention um, a comment here that I think is related to that. Um, give me one quick second here. Um, so we have someone saying, um, this isn't necessarily a new argument. It's as relevant as it is today. Uh, I'm sorry, it's as relevant today as it was then, except today we have the capability to create clean air energy. Ask anyone who needs a, to feed a family which is more important to them, jobs or environment. The key is to combine the two by creating non-polluting industries. So thinking about that comment and about how we can, how we can survive alongside maybe the progress of industry, um, I'll, let you, I'll let you speak to that. Um, 
Thank you. And maybe click ahead to the next image that that Joel was so kind to yes. share, um, which is of the dumping of slag, um, which is a byproduct of the steel making process. Um, and and I want to talk a little bit about slag and Nine Mile Run, which many of you probably have walked through Frick Park and, and know the stream in Lower Frick called Nine Mile Run and maybe have been at the Somerset Housing Development, which was developed on top of slag. Um, but in, in leading up to that, I just want to maybe just touch on, Lisa, the question that you brought up. Um, I think we need to really reconsider what we mean by progress. I think yeah. if we're serious about non-polluting industries, that requires, if we're serious about real sustainable development, and what I like about Andrea's um, comment here, Andrea, um, is, is this insistence on knitting together the idea of jobs in the environment, which is part of a sustainable development ethos. Um, but I think that really requires a, a massive, a radical reimagining of how we think about what progress is, what development is, what is capital really all about. Um, and I actually think there was a comment made in the chat by Daniel Kirby um, about this idea that is profound to imagine Frick as a capitalist seeing the beauty of nature as a commodity he can purchase and keep for himself while destroying it for others. And I actually think that makes perfect sense that he would see it that way because all of nature was a commodity for Frick. Mm -hmm. And in our society still today, nature is largely commodified. That is why I resist the phrasing that we teach beginning in elementary school. We are inculcated to think of the natural world as something that has natural resources that exist for our extraction and our so-called progress. And I think what we've learned is that our so-called progress is actually what will lead to our very real demise, whether it is short-term air, water quality, land being poisoned from 100 years of, of you know, industrial pollution, or I, you can't even say it's long-term anymore, but you know, massive climate disaster. Um, and so coming back to your idea about what's past is prologue, this is the past. So if we kind of focus in on a very specific site that relates to Henry Clay Frick and his daughter, Helen, who had this vision of creating a park uh, for the children of Pittsburgh and convinced her father to, to donate some of their private lands for this, which he ultimately did. The lower part of what is now Frick Park was actually a slag heap. Um, and I, someone, um, Mary Ann talks about memories of, of mm -hmm. seeing flames from the Mon. I've heard people talk about who live like in, in Swissvale and Swiss Home Park, which is kind of right in that part of, of the East End, they would like go get ice cream and go watch the slag dump at Nama Run. They filled in an entire valley, 200 million tons of slag. And I think what's so important is to think about how do we make sense of that history? And then how do we um, really rely on artists, scientists, um, historians to help us think about a different future. And the Nine Mile Run story is a perfect example of that. So um, on the left, you see images of, um, these are plants that are growing out of that slag heap now. Uh, these are taken by a, an ecologist, a botanist who's been doing work on the slag heap, um, Marion Holmes. Um, and there's so much life that is, that is present there, even in the midst of a huge industrial pollution site. Um, we, I wish we now we did have that slide, Joel, that you suggested, but you know, maybe 20 years ago now, um, there was a group of artists who had a different vision. And this is what I mean about a radical reimagining of the future. They had a radical reimagining of what might happen in Nine Mile Run. And when the city wanted to culvert the rest of that stream and bury it and just pretend that it didn't exist, it was artists who led the charge brought in scientists to really bring in the evidence that they needed um, and convince the city and ultimately the federal government to rather than bury the stream to to renovate the stream and actually click the next slide because there's some images there of that um, this stream restoration that 
I hope many of you have walked through. Um, this is still one of the largest urban stream restoration projects in the nation. Uh, over two miles of stream were restored. This was um, managed by the Army Corps of Engineers and the city of Pittsburgh. Um, and it's an absolutely beautiful site, but it is still filled with pollution, sewage pollution in this case, which is another thing that we haven't talked about in terms of past as prologue. Um, you know, we have combined sewer overflows, um, still dumping sewage into the stream. And that is because, again, our orientation towards the natural world at the time that they were building um, sewer lines, they were trying to protect human health, but they just thought, oh, we're just going to push it downstream and it'll go away. And we won't have to think about it anymore. Well, what we know now is that's not true. And now we're looking at a multi-billion dollar fix. That's why everyone's PWSA rates are going up because we have these combined sewer overflows into waterways that we use for drinking. Um, so it's, mm -hmm. it's so complex, it's so um, um, difficult to disentangle these historical patterns that we have, and, and I think we absolutely have to going forward. Um, and thank you for clicking on the Frick Environmental Center, because this is an example of a project that the Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy did with the city of Pittsburgh, where we said, okay, we're going to build a new environmental center. How do we think about a building that is as light on the land as you possibly can be. So this is net zero energy. There's um, solar panels that feed into the grid that actually it's net, it's been net positive energy the last couple of years. It's net zero water. So rather than contributing um, sewage into that nine mile run and ultimately the Mon, all the sewage is treated on site. The rainwater is collected from the rooftop. Um, all of the materials were sourced locally, including steel, wood, concrete. Uh, all the materials had to be vetted through a red list so that it would be healthy both for people and planet. So this is the kind of um, this is the kind of project that I want to see more of happening. Mm -hmm. This is this is what I want to see as progress. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, you. I will say again to everyone that you that this is work that you spearheaded and. It is a beautiful, um, I think it's a sort of a bit of a beacon um, for what can be. So it's, it was really lovely to watch it become. Um, and to, I drive by it every day on my way to work. Um, <laughs> but I wanna, Kim, I wanna ask you quickly about maybe the irony, as Joel pointed out earlier, of this being called the Frick Environmental Center. <laughs> um, you touched on it, and I know that it's it was a driving a bit of a driving force in how, putting together this exhibition. Is that is I'm going to say that say it again. The juxtaposition. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think to Marika Marika's point earlier about sustainable future and how we get there. Um, men like Frick and Carnegie and other industrialists of the past, they weren't interested. Again, what you know what you said about you know they it was a commodity. They could go to um, their summer homes in, in Massachusetts and get away from the, the things they're creating back in their hometown of Pittsburgh, or they could go out to, to South Fork and, and, you know, not necessarily cause the flood, but they had these opportunities to get away. They could go carriage riding in Shenley Park, where these, these places were built for, in theory, for the workers to have a place of respite from their seven day work week, 12 hour shifts to get out and enjoy nature and, and to be, you know, part of the outside environment, but they didn't really have the time for that. And so, back to the sustainable future until we as a society start to value nature instead of its natural resources and what it can provide instead of thinking about drilling in the Arctic or rolling back you know regulations in state parks so that we can do more drilling and more logging and whatever else we're going to do to these areas until the people who benefit most profit-wise monetarily from oil and from coal and from these other resources until they're no longer the people making policy and having their, their hands in political the political arena, we're kind of stuck where we are and we need to do more things like Marika is doing, like Joel was talking about, of, of reimagining what these sites can do and what they can be. But until we can come together as a society and say, we want green energy, we want green resources, I'm not sure where we're going to end up and we, it will be our demise. We will cause our own ending because we just refuse to let go of the past and to move into that prologue and to figure out what we can do moving forward. Thank you. Um, talking about the, I think someone mentioned about um, Frick collecting art and, and as a commodity. 
he also, you know, landscapes were very popular at the time. Um, he collected Malays, which Malay was a, a proponent of kind of glorifying the, the farmer and the agriculturalist. And so I kind of see maybe Frick thinking, these are people who work with their hands and they build something for themselves very much like me, but the laborers in my steel mill, they're getting a wage and they're not the same. And so they're not able to be on that pedestal and be held to that same account. And so I think someone mentions that Frick provide an opportunity for his workers to get out into nature and to get out into the countryside. I don't know mm -hmm. that he did. I haven't come across that in my readings. Maybe someone else in the chat from, from the Frick might be able to address that. But I know Helen Clay Frick um, did establish a, a uh, summer kind of getaway for textile workers in Boston, so, uh, close to where their family summer home was. And so she did see this value in kind of getting people into nature and getting them out of the textile mills and out of these factories and giving them an opportunity to, to be with the outdoors, so she herself enjoyed going carriage riding in Chenley Park and the other areas. So maybe she had that sense that that would be beneficial to society to have that opportunity. But I don't know that Frick really valued his workers enough to even think beyond you should be in the mills 12 hours a day or more if we can get you in there longer. So, Can I just build up something that Kim was saying about um, this was a common thing, like Eden Hall is an example of that too. The Eden Hall campus was a place where female um, workers were sent to kind of get respite from the city. And I think that this um, division of like nature is out there and the city is where you're gonna work and live in, in poor conditions helped kind of justify those poor conditions that then they were gonna give them this respite outside of the city. Um, and unfortunately, I think we still have that attitude with a lot of young people that live in, in urban spaces. I mean, the Fresh Air Fund is still a thing, right? There's still this um, rhetoric around, oh, we have to save these children and give them a chance to be out of the city. Well, no, we need to make the city where people live a place of beauty, a place that is healthy, a place that is sustainable. And that's what Frick Park has the potential to offer. The Pittsburgh region is incredibly rich in parks and green spaces. Do I wanna go out to the Laurel Highlands? Absolutely. Do I love seeing you know, Utah National Parks? Definitely. But on a daily basis, it's Frick Park, it's Riverview, it's Highland, it's Shenley that I'm getting my regular um, interaction with non-human more than human nature. And we need to increase those opportunities for people of all ages and not continue to sell this message. They have to go somewhere else. Joel? Yeah, um, I wanted to uh, um, say a couple of words about um, Namaran also. Um, I think you cannot talk about the achievement of Namaran without talking about two, particularly one visiting artist at Carnegie Mellon University, Tim Collins. I just got an email from the other day, and his, and his wife, Reiko Goto. Um, and they were the people who led the motion, the movement, to not let the stream be coveted, who re realized the potential for having a living stream within the city. And they helped organize a group of people from around the city, faculty from the universities, but people from the community also, to bring about the development of Somerset and of Nine Mile Run, the valley. I was just down by the stream a couple of weeks ago on a, on a good day. And that sign is still there that says you can, if you, the smell you get from the, is with that of sewage. So that's something you really have to um, be still aware of. Um, in spite of, I think it's an important lesson here though. And, and I think Nine Mile Run imparts this lesson too. And that is, what, what do we strive for? Do we strive for restoring for first nature or nature as it was? Or do we basically accept the fact that that's almost an impossibility? And Frederick mm -hmm. Olmsted, by the way, not the, necessarily the, uh, the son, but the original uh, Frederick Olmsted, and the son too probably, realized that second nature was what we should strive for and to achieve. Um, and that if we tried to restore first nature, it was going to be almost an impossible task. And I think that's very important to keep in our minds. And because some of these things would not have taken place if we had not been content, you know, to do the best we could with what we had. Um, 
you know, and, and move on from there. So uh, as I said, I think that um, the, the, the thing about Nine Mile Run is terrific people like Marika, for instance, and Tim Collins and Rako Goto and Bob Bingham and so on, who came together basically to push that project over the years and to get it moving. Thank you, Joel. Um, I can't believe it's almost been an hour and I have 400 million questions still. Um, I'm going to ask one final question and then if, if you're if you need to go, I understand, um, but I'm going to address the questions that you have posed in the chat and Q&A um, after this last question. Um, so I guess <laughs> this is not on our core question list, but I, this is such a simple question. Um, like, what do we actually do then to, you know, it's, it is, someone mentioned, like, this is not an old or this is not a new question that we're asking, um, but it is imminent. And so from your, like Joel, from your knowledge of the industrial past impact and Marika, your knowledge of, you know, or your, you, you mentioned a sustainable development ethos um, and Kim, your, not, your understanding of reflecting back and really seeing what we can do moving forward, what do we do? <laughs> um, what do we do, Joel? Well, what do I? Well, I, as I said, I am a historian. I'm not necessarily an activist. Um, <laughs> I want to just point out, though, that we are facing some severe challenges again in this region, and not from coal necessarily anymore, but from fracking mm -hmm. and from the fracker plants um, in terms of understanding the health impacts of these, um, these, uh, these facilities um, on the surrounding areas and understanding fully the environmental impacts of extensive fracking, not necessarily only of the cracker plant, but extensive fracking going on in order to supply the cracker plants. You know, so we really have to think about the consequences of what we're creating and whether we want to again have to live with some of the problems from the past. Mm. Thank you. Kim? Yeah, it is hard Kim, to- remember. Kim, what do we do? <laughs> <laughs> well, what is the saying? Those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. So I think we really do have to look at what was going on and kind of what's changed, what hasn't changed. A lot hasn't changed. We really haven't addressed the, the problems that got us here. And the big one is greed. I mean, if you look at it overall, it's about money and power and those who refuse to give it up and, and won't move on from that. And so until we can get to a place where money is not the most important thing and profits over people and profits over land and nature, we're not gonna get anywhere. So I think that's really the, the big one is to kind of like Marika was saying, we have to prioritize what is important to us. And we, we, can't, we can't breathe money and we can't live on a planet that doesn't, that's made of dollar bills. So if we don't have that environment to sustain us, we are unsustainable. I will, before Marika, you say, um, to speak on it, I, I want to say, Kim, I think maybe there's a glimmer of hope in that we, from the Frick, are bringing this conversation and talking about um, these things, acknowledging who we are, who, you know, who, what our story is, um, acknowledging the past, as you all have said, um, and using our voices to move forward and to address um, the ever-present issues, Joel, as you mentioned. So- um, there are young activists out there who do see this and who are pushing for this. Yeah. So not that I want people to, to go away, but as older dinosaurs as they were kind of melt into the, the tar pits, um, things, <laughs> things might get a little better for us. Yeah. Marika? I'm, I'm about to teach a class on sustainability, society, and well-being, and kind of the, the big uh, theme that I'll be asking the students to tackle through the whole semester is for them to really identify what their theory of change is. And I think that's what you're asking us. What's our theory of change? What do we do? Um, and I think there are some very loud voices in the environmental movement that have a theory of change that does not really address what Kim raised. 
that does not really address the, the root. That's why I keep on repeating this idea of a radical reimagining because the radical reimagining is about getting to the root of things. So um, if we continue to think that we're gonna identify technological breakthroughs that allow us to still consume everything that we wanna consume, um, that's not really getting to the root of the problem. Um, so I think we need to go a little further back in history than industrialization and really think about kind of what are the cultural roots that drive our sense of human exceptionalism mm. and, and American exceptionalism, but I really think it's about human exceptionalism. We believe that humans are at the top of a hierarchical um, you know, set of beings. Um, and once upon a time, it was just white men that got classified as humans and white women were kind of human on the side ish and then everyone else was not human they were classified with with other lower creatures in that hierarchical um, system. And until we address that, uh, I don't think we can address the greed I don't think we'll stop seeing progress as consumption as use of natural resources, and I think it will be to our end so you know my theory of change is to talk about that as much as I can with people. And hopefully people will start to change their thinking a little bit. And, you know, if you haven't read Braiding Sweetgrass, I highly recommend it. I've read it twice and I learned even more the second time. Um, it's by Robin Wall Kimmerer. She is a um, botanist. She's an indigenous woman. She's a professor. So that's Thank where you. I would say to start. Wonderful. Um, I'm just going to run through our um, our questions that remain um, and comments. Um, if we want to just sort of quickly comment on them, I want everyone to be able to have asked their question. Um, Kim, I'll maybe have you start with this. Did Frick's paternalism extend to, oh, we talked about this, to making his workers explore nature? Um, uh, actually, I don't know why this question is making me think, um, Marika, about your question about philanthropy, um, or and really, I think what it makes me think of is the idea that this class of industrialists had their idea of what it was to be a member of society, a human. They uh, they made these parks, they offered them these spaces but it was because it was what they thought, they thought that's what was best for people. You know, this except, it was exceptionalism maybe for from their point of view. Um, but yeah, that question actually made me think of your point about the positive and negative impact or effects of philanthropy. Any thoughts? Just a nod, a nod. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna have to dig up the, I'll put in the chat another book recommendation that really Please. challenges current yes. philanthropy. That's it, thank you. Thank you, whoever just put it in oh, there. Yes. Um, winners take all. It's a very easy read and it is very on point. And we live in a city that is absolutely dominated by philanthropists um, who have, in many cases, good intentions. But yeah. there's, um, there's a peril to good intentions. Um, yes. So um, that's all I'll say because okay. we're coming to the end. Kim, mm -hmm. do you want to reply uh, reply to that? I would. I would totally agree with that. That that's just yeah. This idea that you're trying to to cover up maybe your wrongdoings through this philanthropy, you know, philanthropy work, like you said, creating green spaces and and down downing and downing libraries and, and all these different things that we think that make society a better place, but not really helping people with the basic human needs that they need to to survive. So you're doing mm -hmm. things in some cases to make yourself feel better or to leave a legacy for yourself in a community so people remember who you are, but you're not really helping the people and not not directly. So yes, it's nice to have a place to go or it's Reading is great. I, I love libraries, but food on your table, a roof over your head, a, a sustainable roof that isn't a shackle or a hovel that's falling down that isn't right next to the, the smoke infused landscape that you're working in every day. That really would have benefited a lot of these people at this time more so than 
park space or or libraries or other things with you know your name blazoned in gold on a building doesn't help anybody. Great, thank you, um, Joel. I want to ask you. Um, someone commented, um, "The industries that drove Pittsburgh." have not disappeared. They just disappeared from Pittsburgh. So what do we owe to the cities and countries where these industries are now? Well, I'm not sure um, what, what we owe. It's certainly true that the steel industry um, shifted to Brazil, for instance, and to Korea, mm -hmm. and it shifted overseas um, in many ways. And, um, um, it's part of this process um, of, of, of change that occurs in the competitive capitalistic world of, um, of winners and losers. And um, I think one of the big problems that we have is that we tend still to dump um, an awful lot of our pollution loaded materials and wastes in um, other parts of the world. Um, we call the developing world, if you will, or whatever it is. Um, and that's clearly something that is um, reprehensible. We should not be doing. But I keep on thinking about also about plastics. You know, um, I think what are we waiting for in regard to plastics? We know plastics are a huge problem. Mm -hmm. and we, we keep on thinking that somebody's going to find a microbe or something like that that's going to take care of the plastics that are, are filling up our oceans and our seas. So as a we continue to consume, we continue to pro pro produce, um, we continue to be wasteful. Uh -huh. uh, and um, I, I, you know, I, I think that we, we, we really need to get a group of leaders. And I wanna say this is important, leaders who are thoughtful, who know what they're doing in terms of attempting to right some of the wrongs of the past and to lead us down new pathways um, for the future, if it may be solar energy or away from fossil fuels and so on. But these things cannot really happen on their own. They have to happen with leadership. The leaders can come from all parts of society. They don't only have to come, they shouldn't necessarily only come from philanthropy or the very rich, but getting thoughtful people together um, to realize that the human experience is at stake. Mm -hmm. It is at stake. Mm. Okay. Yes. Okay, bye everyone. I'm just kidding. <laughs> we won't end on that, but you're you're not wrong. Um, I want Joel. I did want to share one thing with you. Someone mentioned you in a comment. Um, I just want to thank you for doing this. My father, Gene Levy was a close colleague of Joel oh, and took yeah. many walks and pictures of the region in the 70s and 80s. He would have loved these discussions. Um, brings back my childhood to see Joel. That's a, that's a nice thing. Thank you, Alicia. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, Daniel says, one thing I feel is worth noting is that environmental destruction is not unique to capitalist economies. The Soviet Union was notorious um, for its environmental devastation, though I do feel that the impact can still be contextualized as an effect of greed, even though the motivation wasn't oriented around the money. That's a really great point, Daniel. That's a very, very good point. Yes. Um, I, there's so many lovely things. Um, I'll say this, I think this is maybe our last one. If you have any burning questions, um, send it now. <laughs> but um, Sue has said, I appreciate these acknowledgement, acknowledgements of the power of industrial aesthetic, particularly as it relates to nostalgia. While our communal focus right, uh, rightfully should be on the remediation and improvement of our physical environment in the wake of the decline of the big steel of big steel in Pittsburgh, we shouldn't ignore the impact of unresolved grief at the loss of Pittsburgh's status. That is, that's deep, Sue. I <laughs> like that is something well said, beautifully put. Um, I, this was just lovely. Um, I think we're good. I think we have got through the comments. If you see any in there that I, I didn't touch on, um, Marika, do you want to read that to everybody as we we go out? 
it's just a great Baldwin quote. Yeah. The old world is dying and a new one kicking in the belly of its mother time announces that it is ready to be born. This birth will not be easy and many of us are doomed to discover that we are exceedingly clumsy midwives. <laughs> that's, I think that's a perfect way to end. Um, Joel, thank you for your wisdom and um, the lifetime of, of understanding and knowledge that you bring um, and what you are able to share with us. We learned so much from you, so thank you. And Marika, it's been a pleasure to work with you again. Um, Kim, as always, um, just wonderful insight, I feel, into um, not just the Frick, but but these themes, these topics. Um, so thank you, each of you. I really, um, I really appreciate it, and I'm happy that we've had this time. And I want to thank everybody for joining us, um, and join us again for the next conversation. Um, and I hope to see you all soon um, again. So thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Lisa, everybody. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. Have a good evening.